Hello, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, whenever you are listening to this, watching this, consuming this, allowing me to enter your ears and therefore your brain. Now I'm sticking to your brain like glue, just like that Sean Paul song. (laughs) You know, that's what he was actually referring to in that song, Like Glue. Me gon' stick to your brain. That's the Sean Paul song that people don't know about. Me gon' stick to your brain. That uh, song was actually on the Billboard charts for 78 years. That's true. So, uh... Me gon' stick to your brain. I'm gonna start with the sketch. While I sketch, I'm going to talk a little bit. This is Dom's Sketchcast, episode 35, with very special guest, Davigo. Davigo. I'm just going to write his name right here. On this drawing. On this nice, happy, lovely drawing. My cadence is definitely going to be a little bit different. Uh, in this episode, and I'm noticing it already. I'm noticing myself allowing the gaps because that's the sort of thing that I need while I draw. I can't, um, I can't just go like Davy's last name. I just got to draw. And those of you who, li- who are listening on uh, iTunes and Spotify, just let me know. Let me know how it is. Let me know how this differs from my usual super high speed of talking, I think. I'm drawing some kind of a uh, person with a head for a knife. A knife for a head? A head for a knife. <laughs> Whenever they want to cut things, they just they just use the side of their head. They just... Shading in, shading in this person's stuff. I don't know, it kind of occurred to me that a lot of you are drawers and creative people. I don't think uh, non-creative people are watching me. And um, (laughs) a lot of you have been sending these amazing ass drawings. And I would like to think that maybe some of you are drawing while you're watching or listening to this. I know um, for sure Tommy Tootsters does. Tommy Tooster is one of the top supporters of this program. This here program. And add some cheekbones to this. I've been thoroughly enjoying uh, drawing people's drawing people's uh, eyes going off their face. Completely. I like it when things don't make sense. Like melting solid wood dolly clocks and stuff like that. That stuff is not supposed to make sense. None of it's supposed to make sense. You feel me? Been thinking a lot about vampires again. For some reason. Specifically. um, Specifically African vampires. Because. I don't know. You don't hear a lot about black vampires. You don't hear a lot about black vampires. Except recently. Obviously in the media. Everyone wants to talk about. Everyone wants to talk about Blade. You know what I'm saying? Like. I don't know. Everyone's been talking about Blade. Everyone's uh, everyone's been emailing me about Blade. Like, Dom, what do you think about Blade? <laughs> Waking me up at three a.m. talking about Blade. People want to know what I think about about the new Blade, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you right now. I think it's amazing. 
that such a great actor would get this role. Such a fantastic, creative person would get this role. A person who has just been, he's just been on the come up and I'm like so glad that this person I'm about to, I'm about to show, show you right now is Blade. Like, come on. The weekend is Blade, everybody. I want you to know that. The weekend is is gonna be Blade, and I'm the official. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll be directing it. I I'm so happy to be telling you these. <laughs> I'm so happy to be telling you this. Uh, yeah, the weekend is Blade. You know, I met him when I was up in Montreal <laughs> last week. <laughs> Cause they had a. They're having a meeting up there. We're having a Black Necromancers Union meeting. We have an annual one every year. It's just like when I used to go to uh, the Jehovah's Witness, the Jehovah's Witness convention when I was younger. Except this one was way more fun, uh, way more exciting. Somehow less talk about death at the Black Necromancers meeting than at, at my uh, Jehovah's Witness meetups when I was younger. Yeah, so uh, I'm directing it and also um, lead animator of this new this new Blade. It's called Blade, Sword of the Fallen, and um, it's going straight to Netflix. It's <laughs> like people don't know about it, but it's going straight to Netflix. Uh, it's kind of a hush hush project right now, but um been doing a lot of work for with the VFX artists. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ. Um <laughs> a lot of work with these VFX artists. And uh I think you all are going to be very happy with what we create. <laughs> ah Jesus. I'm just is tears of joy right now. Okay. So yeah, it's called Blade, Sword of the Fallen, and uh, in the next episode, I'm going to be telling you guys more about it. But today, we got a bunch of interesting stuff coming up for you guys on the show. Our very special guest, I'll introduce him in a few moments. But first, got to tell you guys a few things. If you fuck with what I do, if you fuck with this stuff... If you fuck with this new little thing I'm doing right here. I know what my usual ask is, but I'm not going to ask that today. All I'm going to ask is that you contribute. Just talk. Comment, whatever, especially if you're a lurker. I'm not going to ask anything else from you this episode besides that. Um, I'm genuinely interested in why you watch this. I want to know what's going through your head as you're listening to this. Uh, what are you doing? Like, what are you working on? Working on anything cool? Got any questions? What's on your mind? I think a lot of you have a, have some strange stuff going on in your brains that I would uh, like to be privy to and interact with somehow. Yeah. Okay. So... We're going to have some cool stuff happen in this episode. We're going to talk to Davy Go, a fantastic, amazing illustrator who's Jamaican, and he makes stuff that is super reminiscent of Adam Hughes, Frank Cho, um, J.C. Leyendecker, if you all know him as well. J.C. Leyendecker was a great, a great figurative and uh, illustrative painter. So I talked to Davy Go for about an hour about a lot of stuff like Batman we talked about Batman we talked a lot about the drawing process the process of how he gets commissioned and the interactions with customers which, which can sometimes be difficult we talked about that um, some of the weird sexuality of 90s Marvel comics that comes up as well yeah it's a fun conversation first time I saw these guys drawings I was like He's just, he's legitimately one of those people where it's like, you see it and 
you get that twitch in the back of your head where you're like, man, I do not draw enough. In fact, it's just one of those it's one of those moments where it's like, you know you'll never be able to draw enough. There's never gonna be like there are people who sort of you see them drawing and you're like, Oh, I'm I'm reminded that there's a certain level there's a certain thing I am never going to be able to achieve. So I'm like, okay, I, I really have to stay in my lane because this motherfucker has the 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 pinup comic art thing just like a fucking diamond. It's pretty incredible. So after the Dabby Go conversation, we're going to talk about you. Yes, you who are listening slash watching. We're going to talk about the Tyler drawing. I did a little kind of simple how to draw Tyler video a few days ago and um, a bunch of you sent in Tyler's. So I wanted to talk about your Tyler's, um, say a few things about them and give you guys a little gift for doing that. Also, we got some really cool questions, super, super cool questions I'm excited to get into. So that's all coming up after the Dabby Go interview. I hope while you're listening to it, uh, while you're listening to this, you're doing something creative I know writing is kind of hard while writing is kind of hard while you are hearing someone talking, but maybe you're drawing, painting, making some music or something that would be really cool. If you're doing that as well, I'd like to see it. Let's hit this Davy Go interview, and then after the chat slash interview, we'll get back to you. Okay, Davy Go, let's go, let's do it. When I was a child. I used to read. <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh! Don't laugh! I'm, I'm I'm being serious. I used okay. to read Wizard Magazine. I felt like I felt like Biggie. It was all a dream. I used to read Wizard Magazine, and some of the artists I would see in there looked. Um, the stuff that they made was so was so baffling to me how they were able to create. Two of these artists come to mind: Adam Hughes and Frank Tro, right? Mm-hmm. And right now, I'm floating throughout the internet, doing my thing, you know, existing in inside and out the digital realms. And you know, you see all kinds of artists. You th- see all kinds of artists, and you you float around. And a lot of them are amazing. Some of them are not amazing. But I stumbled across a very special artist recently who reminded me of those two artists I had mentioned before. But as something as a kind of a hybrid and something greater. And I was very fascinated, and I started searching this artist more. And <laughs> obviously, he's sitting here uh, talking to me right now, but I'm going to still talk about him in third person until I, <coughs> until I see, as long as I see fit. So, um, a fantastic artist is my guest today on DSC. Um, I imagine we'll be talking a lot about art and some other shit. Uh, please introduce yourself to the people. Oh, wow. I don't know if I can do anything better than what you just did for me. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm Davigo. I am an uh, an illustrator. I typically work with comics and uh, commercial illustration altogether. Um, And I'm not sure what else to say. I'm from Jamaica. Yeah, that's that's one of the main things that caught my eye because I, I saw your work and I was like, and naturally you just get curious about what people look like, who who are the people making these images. I was like, this this Caribbean man. I'm Haitian. I don't know <laughs> if you knew that, but um, oh no, I didn't. Cool. Yeah, that's why I felt a kinship, and I was like, huh? this is this is fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. Wizard Magazine. Let's start there. Did you did you read it? Are you familiar with it? I am familiar. It's not something I ever read. But it takes me mentally to like heavy metal, which I am a huge fan of and always have been a huge fan of since uh, my teenage years. And obviously you're talking about the, I believe, it, like late 70s uh, animated film. No. Oh, well, that one was really cool, too. Oh. But the magazine that started that film. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. So it, it started from a magazine. Yeah. As far as. I know I could be wrong, but I definitely know that it's they're related. It's a, it's the same people. So for those who don't know, um, I've never watched the film in, in in its entirety. But like, tell us a little more about the magazine and the, and the film and why you enjoy it. Oh sure. So 
I remember almost nothing about the film outside of the stunning lead character. It's this super sexy kind of dominatrix blonde lady in like red and this red and black like leather bikini type of thing. It's ridiculous, completely obnoxious and uh, completely right up my alley. I love seeing that type of thing, that type of strong, sexy, gorgeous woman just going around killing and kicking ass. That's 100 percent me. Yeah. Um, and that's the movie. Don't remember the plot. Don't remember anything. I do remember there was some like kind of sci-fi alien type of vibe going on, if memory serves. The magazine follows that trend quite a bit. It's a sci-fi fantasy kind of celebratory magazine. It covers a lot of that type of art, sci-fi, fantasy, comics, that type of thing. And it's just kind of this, I want to say underground and it's kind of hard to gauge the popularity because it's it's not something that I I have anybody to talk to about. But it's one of, it has an underground vibe in terms of its whole image is very like the name suggests heavy metal, very you know rock type of one of those cool things that you know you probably would have shared with a friend in that basement growing up. So it's just something that. I did uh, friend them since I really do a favorite mental magazine. Sorry, you you cut off a little bit. Let's um, you say the last few seconds again. You said it's something that you. Oh sure, so it was a magazine that I was introduced to by friends as a teenager, and I've just really been a fan ever since. Hmm. I mean, it's definitely a subculture, and I think, uh, you know, the the teen years are a great time for you to sort of discover discover those things that maybe you shouldn't be looking at or that people tell mm-hmm. you you should have been afraid of. And I think, you know, when I think back to my, um, you know, actually actually my, my preteen years as well, my, my preteen years and teen years, it was a lot of me discovering shit that a lot of my friends didn't know about and sharing it and i guess to some extent that's still happening as adults but like that's when like the concrete is wet you know like that's like when your your brain is still yeah you're still trying to figure out what you are and why there are certain things that you really are attracted to for instance like i i think i think some of this stuff you're kind of born with where there are just some some aesthetics that you just you you know it you see it and it was for you you uh-huh. saw this woman who you know had like a a bra that was just like a, literally like a line of, you know covering her nipples uh-huh. like, oh yeah this is what i like i for me exactly I think, do you remember witchblade i know of witchblade yeah uh, as in like i know the name it's not something i i know about really in detail yeah, she was uh she was a the nineties were an interesting interesting time for character design. I, I know that but we're kinda of going to your realm of expertise because you, you clearly know a lot like you know your shit in terms of nineties character design. But like speci- specifically if you're talking about sexuality and women's sexuality in comics, it was like when we were growing up It was up, a very sexy era. Yeah, but like a particular type of sexy it was like this this fever dream where it was like everyone was wearing latex but it wasn't just latex it was almost as if like you could paint on it's like if you painted on a layer of clothing you know yes. it's not it's not really it's not cotton it's not even latex because latex like you can't really... absolutely cut out again oh yeah it's... um yeah because latex you can you can't really see that many like folds and muscles inside of it but like you know like the x-men like you look at cyclops and you can see his abs through his shit you can see it and it's like like how did we how did we get mm-hmm. to this point it's very interesting yeah. that that it happened in the in the 80s and late 80s and the 90s that way um yeah i think you're absolutely right it was a very distinct look like you'd read comics and everybody just looked like they were wearing body paint really and um it's Personally, not something I was a huge fan of. Uh, well, as far as the colors go, like that's when I feel like comics really started to get an image for what people would think of when they thought of the comics industry. Um, as far as people who weren't necessarily fans initially, you thought of comics, you thought of this look, and it's this high contrast, bright colors, 
body paint costumes and it's completely ridiculous completely out there very uh very costumey i would say um and it was just uh a re let's say a really distinct era um and a lot there are really strong traces of that still lying around we still love those bright colors in the books themselves whenever we translate uh, comics to screen we always want to try to mute out those colors which i enjoy sometimes sometimes i wish they were a bit more faithful but sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't hit or miss um but you do remember that from the late 80s early 90s that bright that body paint that, that almost like everybody was always on show always flexing yeah. <laughs> you know yeah that type of look it's strange to imagine like you take a, the first character I think of is Wolverine. It's like mm -hmm. you, you, you got to think, I mean, and this is really, this is modern comics thinking. I don't know that people were having this conversation as much back then, but like you, you take a guy like Logan, we all know his story. I mean, this is a guy who's like 200 years old. His, his memory goes all the time. He's a drunkard. I, I actually, I don't know if he drinks, but he's like a very gruff guy, very dark, mm -hmm. a lot of fucked up shit about him. How did Xavier convince him to put on a yellow suit? Ye all right? Bright <laughs> yellow, running through the woods. Ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. And, and, the, and the pointy stuff at top, it's like, who's, whose idea it, it was this? It's like, why, why is this a thing? It, it doesn't really make sense. I don't, yeah. It definitely is strange, like to think about the types of characters, and then you look like you look at how they actually dress in. Like you don't think about it as a child reading these books, and you don't really process it quite so heavily. But then looking back with a bit more clarity as an adult, you're like, "That's strange. That doesn't quite add up." But it's fun nonetheless, I guess. So it it it, it perseveres. It goes on. Yeah, I think it's reflective of. I think all of this stuff reflects our our mind state, and I think currently what I'm hearing a lot from comics people, and I don't know, maybe you can confirm this, but it's like I see a lot of us thinking way more critically about um, character design and how practical things are, not only in terms of visuals, but who the character is. And I think this is a good segue mm -hmm. to, I mean... You draw Batman as like this. I, I I like this version of Batman you do where he's like he's like hyper gay sexualized. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. where, but he's like, even yeah. his his body proportions have changed in that in that moment. And to me, that is like that's you taking this character and sort of you're adding a very valuable twist on it where it's like, okay, well well like how do I add a different perspective or look on it? Because Otherwise, we're going to keep looking at the same Batman. And you see this happening with the Batman who laughs. You see it happening even with Christian Bale and, and Christopher oh, Nolan yeah. to some extent. Like, and and that's, that's the value of these characters. But I think we're getting a lot more critical about, okay, well, why do I have to draw him? in that way because i mean it's it's been done batman's been drawn in the adam west style a million ways blah blah, blah. each any way you can think of this guy it's it well most ways you can think of batman it's been done so to get it like people i think are looking for unique unique ways that make sense to the individual creating it absolutely and i'm glad that you touched on the batman aesthetic right let's start there um and Initially, my mind runs to Bab Star, her recent or yeah, you know, still pretty recent redesign of Batgirl's costume. I don't before know, can we you had spell her name. I don't know who this is. Yeah, sure. So Babs is her first name. B A B. I think it's two B's. Could okay. be wrong, but B A. Let's say B A B S. Yeah. And her last name T A R R. Okay. Uh, she's a illustrator, really talented, really awesome oh. lady doing her stuff out there. Um, and then. A few years ago, she uh, came up with a new design for the Batgirl costume, and I fell in love. I mean, and I feel like everybody else did too. What, it what was, is it that you like about this one? Can you, can you describe it a little bit? Like how, how it yeah, for sure. what people are, are seeing in their head? For sure. So before we had a Batgirl that was, you know, the typical spandex, skin tight, spray on, very kind of sexy, very curvy, um, 
skin tight, you know, black and I think red was her thing, uh, costume. Bab Star took it in a different way, taking in consideration that this is supposed to be, I think, a teenage character um, and made it more, uh, I want to say gender neutral. Um, and she's now wearing this uh, very muted purple, almost gray, uh, kind of leather, uh, no, not a jumpsuit. It's a, it's a leather jacket and matching pants. Um, the pants are black and that muted purple, and the top is just that muted, muted purple all over. And it's kind of like this biker jacket almost, but not quite as detailed, right. um, with uh, some zip, uh, zippers on the front, and then her yellow bat logo across her chest. And then the cape, oh my gosh, the way the cape attaches to the jacket. Um, <laughs> it has... <laughs> something that i've never seen them do with capes before in the superhero world it's so cool and it's so simple which is why it's so effective the entire the costume buttons, is very very simple buttons, and very buttons. clean right those two buttons on either side of the shoulder and it just looks so clean but you see it's something it's a it's a new touch in every part of the design where you're seeing where everything fits and you can imagine the, this costume this uh character going in and out of costume very very easily you can see her unzipping her jacket you can see her uh attaching and detaching her cape really easy easily you can see her buckling her belt and her um her whatever that package thing is on her hip you can see her putting on every piece of this really clearly and really easily and it looks practical and at the same time is super cool to look at it just looks so comfortable but simultaneously it still looks super cool which is something that can be really tricky to achieve but she hit it all the way out of the park but i'm like and then to even touch even more on her youthfulness her teenage uh aesthetic she's not wearing like some crazy uh uh pants shoes combination you see her pants and then you see her wearing some fun what looks like uh yellow dr martins yeah is what they yeah. look like to me and i just i love that she's taking these cute cues from like urban street fashion and putting them into a superhero costume and it doesn't look like it's trying to be street cool like a lot of times it can look that way it can look like you know kind of try hard but with her, it looks so effortless, so seamless, so easy, and so believable. And I'm completely in love to take that to how I like to draw Batman. I try to think of a human being when I'm drawing him seriously for customers. When I'm doing my thing, I just be ridiculous. And I like mm -hmm. to have fun with him because Batman is one of those really mm, protected franchises. It's one of those really uh, glorified franchises that people are really sensitive about and really passionate about, which is awesome. It is a really uh, great character, um, but it's one of those characters that is very defined, uh, especially with the more fresh take that we've had on him over the past couple of decades where they're trying to make him more dark, more kind of believable, as believable as somebody going around and killing, well, not killing people, but fighting crime in a uh, leather costume with pointy ears can be. Um, but with that in mind, it's a very defined character, a character defined by this brute, brooding masculinity. And it's always been fun for me in general, but particularly with a character like this, to play with that and to completely kind of mock it. Not that I don't enjoy Batman, not that I want to necessarily disrespect Batman, but I want to disrespect what he kind of, not disrespect, but I want to play with what he means to people whenever I do my own personal take on him. Whenever I'm drawing Batman for customers or clients, it's a different story. I will say more, you know, um, true to form even still putting my take on maybe his costume or his energy a bit mm. but when i'm just drawing him for me i like to go wild i like to completely go off the rails and say hey this is is this your god you know <laughs> this is this is your god in my hands you know and kind of just completely make him look uh ridiculous but also just have a laugh it's it's not that deep and some people get really sensitive about characters like these especially somebody so powerful and influential as batman and i like to play with that i like to play with power complexes see i think it still works though like like 
I think I'm imagining the the angry nerds and like I already know the kind of stuff that they're saying like, oh he looks frail whatever and I'm thinking about that and it's like I've always I've always felt this kinship towards depictions of Batman when he is a little more skinny and like I think Todd yeah. Klein used to do this when when he the, the the cowl would come up off his shoulder and curl up right those mm-hmm. Batman and in his in his uh, the ears would be fucking like two feet long, like that <laughs> Batman. Yes. Yeah, so almost mm-hmm. like the Arkham Asylum Batman. That Batman is is not he's not big. He's like he's kind mm-hmm. of like a he's kind of like brittle almost. You feel like you could almost mm-hmm. snap him, but I think that almost like a vampire vibe. Right, and I I always loved, I've always loved that, and I think I'm looking at the I'm looking at your your more playful Batman right here. And the reason I think it still works is because, like, it it is terrifying. Like, Batman's mm-hmm. original purpose was to be scary, was to be what he fears. I think mm-hmm. this idea of, like, there's, there's really something beautiful in here where it's, like, imagine this hyper-masculine guy where it's, like, I fuck women, I'm Bruce Wayne, blah, 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 blah. Right? <laughs> right? So he's, he's walking around and he's doing exactly what we expect rich dudes to do right and Mm -hmm. when he puts the bat suit on though with this batman when he puts this bat suit on it's just like it's like he turns into like this this like eerie like skinny like and his his sexuality is fluid right but i think that Mm -hmm. uh, that adds to i i don't i i feel like it's it's so different it's something that we don't see and i think that batman is like you don't you don't expect him. And it's like if that guy shows up at your at your in your window, it's like you're probably mm-hmm. more likely to like to me, I'm like, I, I don't know what this guy's gonna do. This, this this Batman is new and different and I think embodies more of the opposite of what what Bruce Wayne is. I feel like the traditional mm-hmm. Batman is too close to Bruce Wayne in a way. Does that make any sense? yeah no i totally get what you mean um because the batman we know is this like like we mentioned this kind of uh perfect image of brooding masculinity right but then when i take batman when i get batman on my drawing table i play with the aspect i like to focus on the parts of him that are supposed to be more tortured and twisted Mm. and try to to imagine the, those motivations manifesting in kind of a different way. I want to focus on the part where he's supposed to be creepy, he's supposed to be scary, he's supposed to unsettle you. He's supposed to do half his crime fighting job just by uh, his look alone. He's supposed to scare you first, scare you right, so much that you right. might want to stop before he even has to hit you, right? Yeah, you shouldn't um, pull, pull your gun. But yeah. e- exactly, you see this creepy vampire shadow coming around the corner you're like wait let me rethink this and how we've seen him use fear so far it's, it's it has been with brute force you're scared yes. of him because he can take down 10 guys all on his own with just his hands and that's really scary and that's really cool we love that but then what if he scares you in a different way this time what if you're scared because you're confused what if you're scared because you don't know what he's going to come with i recently did uh, an animation. I guess it was last year. Me and my crew did this animation where I had this idea of. I think you're really gonna fuck with this. Where I basically <laughs> my my version of Batman I think is closer to yours. He's less he's less sexual. Um, mm-hmm. but I think we're I think we're on a similar wavelength. Where like my version of Batman is pure shadow, and you can only see his eyes and his teeth, right? But it's just yes. he's like a he's like a a, a sort of inky shadow. I'm making a, a motion with my hands that the viewers can't see. <laughs> Almost like a you ever seen you ever seen um the fuck is that movie with uh, the two damn alien the, the aliens arrival? Have you seen that? Love 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 okay. love love that movie. Remember. Um, the, the ink, ink rings? Yeah, the ink. The the, the ink drawings mm-hmm. that they would do. Mm-hmm. I feel Their like language. that's 
Yeah, so it's like if you could turn that into Batman, like that's kind of how I see it. Anyway, I did this animation where he encounters Poison Ivy, and I depicted Poison Ivy literally as a bunch of plants that are just talking to him, and she spits this spore into his mouth. Right when he's when he's talking to when he's talking to her, she spits into his mouth, and then he's just coughing and he escapes. Right, but I wanted okay. to. I wanted to play with this idea of like basically her forcefully impregnating him and him having to deal with like his issues of like Batman is really about, you know, losing your parents, not knowing if you can continue on and have kids because to me, having kids seems to be like one of the things that would terrify him more than anything else. Right. Because he'd be afraid of failing. Right. He's probably more comfortable running it and just fighting killer croc than the idea of having to rear a child you know what i mean yeah um first of all like you said i heavily fucks with that yeah <laughs> whole concept i am in love right now and i actually would love to hear a lot more about that um afterwards uh parenthood for batman i think that definitely might be one of his core fears coming from um the background that we know that he comes from losing his parents and it being like his one core motivation as a character, as a human being. Um, I feel like he'd be terrified of the potential loss because one day either he's going to lose the child or the child is going to lose him. There's no getting around that, you know, that's how life works. I feel like he would definitely be hung up about that. But then there's this extra layer with your concept. It's n- not traditional parenthood, is it? being uh invaded by right. this kind of foreign life source uh it's it's a strange place to be in and i i can't even begin to imagine the dynamics of that type of uh being in that type of situation i feel like that's definitely a, a, a way new challenge for batman that i would love to see him uh explore and see how he would navigate that as especially even another layer as somebody who's supposed to be so big on preserving life at all costs, um, oh. knowing that you now he has the new challenge of being a mother <laughs> to yeah. a life force that's invading his body quite literally. I, I can't even imagine being in, being in, the, in those shoes. I think especially as, as men, it's kind of, it's impossible for us to think about that stuff. And, and you know, I'm not... Um, I'm not going to use this as a soapbox or anything. I, just, I legitimately, like, objectively think it's... I'm fascinated by pregnancy. All my friends who've been pregnant have told me that, like, it's weird for women, too. You <laughs> know, it's really weird for them. But, like, I think... Um, I'm imagining that he'd probably have to talk to Constantine about it. <laughs> He'll figure out how to get that... How, how to get that, that baby out of him. You know what I'm saying? You figure out some right. some way out of it. So... How do you get your commissions? What are, what's the process? What do you like about it? What do you dislike about the commission process? What tell me about that? So, uh, with like just character drawings, like fan art, if somebody just wants me to draw either a favorite character or draw somebody that they care about or anything like that, those are pretty straightforward. You can shoot me an email. I prefer emails because then I can keep everything organized. Uh, that way and you know I have my filters and everything it's just a lot easier for everybody involved um, shoot me an email uh, you tell me what you want you can pay for me the money and you're on my list and I get to work as soon as I can um, and that's pretty much it I use PayPal typically for those uh, one and done character uh, permissions and then for larger projects, that really just depends on the project. Really, those that's there's a lot of a lot of gray area. If I'm working on a comic or if I'm working on another kind of you know kind of miscellaneous project, I, I kind of take those as they come mm. um, and handle them as they need handling because it, it's not as easy to have like a set uh, way of working on. A larger project because everyone is going to beat me everyone is going to need a special way of handling and i just i i navigate those as they come while still keeping in mind my core values my core rules and knowing uh exactly the type of work i want to do and staying away from what 
doesn't suit me um, because being able to do something doesn't necessarily mean that it's what I should be doing. Because yeah, I technically probably could be doing architecture. I technically could be doing fashion design or mm. try design or you know other types of creative, but more technically creative types of things. Um, I could, I can, I know how to draw a straight line. I know a little <laughs> bit about architecture from uh, that technical drawing class in high school. Um, but it's not enough to say that it's something I should be doing. So I'm very careful about what I do today. And I'm very careful about what I say yes to. Um, even when I'm feeling more exploratory, I'm, I, I don't say yes to certain things. I don't, um, even when the project itself might be so, uh, sorry, you cut out I the last few yes seconds. To... Hit me again. Say that again. Well, sure. Is this better? Yep. You said even when the project Maybe. is, yep. Right. Okay. So even when the project might inspire me or might seem right up my alley in terms of what it's about and what it's offering, um, I'll say no to certain types of people and certain types of energy. How um, do you, well, describe the um, the no's. Like what are, what is a dead giveaway for you in terms of a no, in terms of energy and how they approach you and all that? Yeah, sure. So I have an absolute zero tolerance for disrespect. Um, and disrespect in forms of impatience disrespect in form of trying to go outside of my rules and try to go outside of my schedule my guidelines i'm i try to be as transparent as possible and i know that may sound like it may fall kind of flat on somebody's ears in this type of world where everybody says they're transparent all the big companies are quote unquote transparent mm. but it doesn't really mean as much as it should but i try to be very honest with what i can and cannot do and what i will and will not do i won't i having currently transitioning from uh, having a nine to five and balancing that with art and navigating that very, very tricky world, mm -hmm. um, having to say to prospective uh, customers and clients like, hey, I cannot meet a, a set deadline right now because I have a job back or I'm doing this and doing that. Like it's my time doesn't, I don't really own my time right now, so I cannot give you a hard deadline and then if somebody's not comfortable with that totally fine i understand in and especially in the culture we have right now where everything is so instant it's hard to say yes to somebody who cannot give you something tomorrow yeah. um and that is something i've had to deal with uh for the past couple of years doing this lately this is me transitioning into doing this full time and uh working the kinks out and getting out of the routine of not being in charge of my time know that i am mm -hmm. it's it's you know still kind of ironing out the transition period between nine to five and now being fully free so one big thing was time and knowing that i didn't have control of my time and anybody coming on board would need to be super flexible for them. and i mean super flexible because i just did not know where my job was taking me for a long time. I was trying to do things there that didn't end up working out because here I am now. Mm. Um, but time was a huge factor, and how people would speak to me, I, I, I'd, 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 I'd gauge that. I'd be like, hmm, "Is this person really understanding?" I, I, I'd be very wary, in particular, people who are ready to throw all their money at me, like, "Oh, I, I, I'll pay whatever," or, or, or "This is the budget, and it's a huge number." And I'm like, "Great, thanks, but can you follow the rules?" Great, thanks, but are you willing to wait a couple of weeks, a couple of months sometimes? Are you uh, patient? Are you understanding? Are you flexible? Because I need that right now, and if you can't work with that, we are going to disappoint each other, and I don't have the energy for that, uh, especially thinking back to how I started out. When I first started out taking commissions, it stressed me all the way to the first hour. Um, I mm. hated it, thought I was trying to think of ways that I would do this for a living because I absolutely hated taking orders and having somebody else determine <sighs> uh, what I was drawing. But then I realized I have to set rules and I have to stick by them no matter what, no matter how much you want, you claim you want to pay for that matter, no matter um, what else, what other kinds of perks you're going to offer, no matter what you're trying to 
give me or do for me in air quotes at all times. I have rules for my mental health. I have rules for not just for me and my personal happiness, but for you. I don't ever want to disappoint customers and clients. Um, I don't ever want to give somebody not only a quality of work that doesn't meet my standards and doesn't make them happy, but I also don't want to give them service that is still part. Customer service is so important to me. It's so important coming from that type of industry in my nine to five job. Mm. Um, I learned a lot about how important it is how you treat people um, from a business standpoint. And I really, I'm so passionate about offering a uh, top tier service. I want to be remembered not just for the quality of my work, but for how I treat people and how my customers feel. I want them to walk away feeling like they just had a spa day and not just because they got a pretty drawing. I want you to feel like you were dealing with a human being who understood you, who went above and beyond for you where possible. Right. It's, it's just, just service is super important to me. So if your needs and my rules aren't collaborating for you to, in my eyes, get the best possible service and the best possible product out of this arrangement, then I'm just going to have to say no, no matter how much you're paying, no matter what else you're offering, if your needs and my uh, abilities and guidelines aren't, aren't meeting together. It's just, it's going to have to be no firm. I'm not going to say yes and have us both be miserable in this. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Now I got to ask you, I, do you have mm -hmm. the contract? I mean, do you have that stuff? Um, have you hired yeah, a for sure. Okay, yeah, that's great. Oh. That that's that's awesome. So as far as a lawyer, no, I don't have a lawyer. I'm still <laughs> too little for that. Okay. Um, but I definitely have my rules that you'd have to agree to when you um you know, pay the invoice, you agree to certain conditions in regards to time frame, in regards to what is gonna cost you more, in regards to uh, what you can get a refund for, what you can't get a refund for. It's all laid out as clearly as I can, I think I can put it. Um, and I hope it is clear for my customers. So far it has seemed to be. I haven't gotten many complaints cool. on that end. I actually can't think of a single complaint I've got complaint I've gotten about my uh, requirements and conditions. Um, and that is in regards to, again, the kind of one and done, just a, draw a character, draw a couple characters that, those are more easy because, you know, I just do this and there's a clear start and end to what your need is. But again, when it comes to bigger projects, if I'm working with a company or with a team or something else, I kind of, we navigate that together, what our needs are on both ends and the contract gets kind of drawn up from that. Again, always still based on my core needs, my core values, always yeah. keeping those in mind and always make sure that those are met as best as possible. I try not to compromise on certain things because, again, it comes down to are we both going to be happy at the end of this? And some of my rules may seem really strict or seem really inflexible, but they are that way for a reason because I know what I offer. I know the conditions under which I can offer them. So I, again, I'm not trying to make either of us unhappy in, in this process, but for character commissions, those are pretty straightforward. The same rules almost every single time. Um, but if I'm working on like a more complex, more nuanced project, then I uh, navigate that with the client and make sure that the contract or the agreement uh, is meeting both of, both of our needs. Gotcha. Very professional. Very good. I mean, do you um, do you have aspirations to uh, do? I, I'm and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know if you've, you've done like covers for DC, Marvel, and any of the big two, Image, Dynamite, any of that stuff. Do you have desire to do that sort of thing? Have you done that? Like, what um, do you have ambitions in that in that realm? That is funny enough, like one of my higher goals in life. Um, and it's funny, I think I'm gonna have to reevaluate that, but for all the right reasons. Because um, not too long ago, I saw an opportunity. <clears throat> excuse me, pop up where it just made me realize that I'm closer to that goal than I thought it was possible to be mm -hmm. at this stage in my career. Um, but yes, I do covers. I haven't worked with Marvel or DC yet, um, but that is on the, I don't want to say bucket list because it's 
it's really not that far away. Um, as far as I'm, I'm seeing my career going right now. But I have uh, done a cover recently for Skybound Comics. You should be seeing that. I'm not sure how long, but it's, it, it was a variant cover. I did a bit of a preview of it a few weeks ago. But covers is definitely one of my passions and something that I'm working on uh, getting my portfolio up to industry standard. Because mm. um, I know that most of what people see from me is just the character drawings. And those aren't covers. They really aren't. They don't really tell a story. They just show the character and it's kind of that and then, you know, move, moving on. Right. But a, cur- a cover needs to do more. A cover needs to have certain aspects that give you a hint about what the story is going to be about. And that is totally affected. Um, the only reason I, you don't really see that on my social media is because the character drawings are so darn popular as a request. Yeah, uh, customers want to see uh, uh, thank you. And the customers really want to see me draw their favorite characters in my style. And that's awesome. I haven't had, especially in having a nine to five, haven't had the time to really explore the areas of my career that I really want to, because it's been character commissions. Those have been bringing in the bread. Um, mm. So those have taken up my time. But now that I have more time, it's me working on my portfolio kind of quietly and get, getting it to the place that I want it to be to get the job that I'm aiming for. All right, cool. So the, ah, damn, I, for, for my last question, I, I was going to, I was going to ask you to what, what cover you'd most want to illustrate, but I think I want to, I want to try to go a little different. I want to I want to ask you something else. Um All right, I'll ask you I'll, I'll ask you this. Do you think <laughs> if you were if you were at Xavier's Institute, right? You're a mutant and you were uh brought into Xavier's Institute, do you think would you be creeped out like sleeping at night knowing that <laughs> that this guy could potentially enter your brain and influence you or would you be comfortable with him? Do you trust Xavier? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> um, I feel like I would trust him. I feel like even with knowing his power and his ability to just kind of manipulate my mind, I feel like I would trust him just because of his energy. It's one of those characters that is, you know, very pure good vibe so like even knowing his ability to kind of wreck my brain at any given moment right. if he so chooses his commitment to being good and treating everybody so nicely and being for human rights and mutant rights the struggle of men who kind of well at least in their world those two very uh, different value sets I, I feel like I, I, I trust him and I feel really comfortable, actually probably more comfortable knowing that he's home um, to protect. He seems like a good guy. That's that's great. That's really optimistic. I, I love Xavier conceptually. I don't know that I'm comfortable mm-hmm. with like, <laughs> if just a Matt sitting in his office, right? And he's sitting there in that big ass yellow chair. The, 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 the 90s, 90s Xavier w- wheelchair is really dumb. So just fuck that. Um, I like the more modern Xavier. He's, it's a wheelchair. <laughs> it's, it's a fucking wheelchair. I want to see the goddamn wheels in the thing. So he's sitting in the wheelchair and he's invited <laughs> you in his office. I just, I feel like I would just be so creeped out. And then he'd probably be like, you're not creeped out. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm not. And he would just change that shit. So I guess it doesn't even matter how I would feel because he would just change it. Um, but I I love telepaths. I really love them. Um, and I'm also super creeped out by them. Emma Frost, on the other hand, uh, I'm definitely oh. creeped out by her. She, like, oh my god, Emma Frost is just so cool. I'm so I feel sorry. like you'd be following her. I, I'm around. a little biased when it comes to these things. Yeah, of, of course. <laughs> like, I want to be in every I'm class. I signed things. up for all the Emma Frost classes. Everywhere when she turns a villain, I'm a villain too. It's just we have <laughs> to just, do this. With Emma, Emma Frost, this Emma is Frost who I am time. now. Like Beyonce. 
absolutely Emma Frost Hive. I'd be that that stupid bay, bay Hive fan, but for Emma Frost and for Mystique, I just have to be where they are. And I can't think clearly about this this question because it's Emma Frost. It's just the answer is yes. I don't care what the question is. I'm a huge fan of those really strong, really sexy, really conniving, uh, really questionable, morally questionable <laughs> characters. I love a good morally questionable character. Um, <laughs> I know it sounds insane, but I need my characters morally vague. I need my, my car- characters morally nuanced. I need to be uncertain about what they might do next for me to be kind of interested in what they're doing. And Emma Frost is one of those ladies. She's just like, she's doing her thing. And she's out there. She's in charge of her narrative. She's and you just you kind of want to see where it's gonna go next. And I I'm just here for all of it. I know she's she's shaky. I know she's questionable, <laughs> but apologize. honestly, yeah. Emma Emma, do what you will. I am here for it. <laughs> I just you know just give me a little heads up if you can. If not, then I'm still there. I'm just a huge fan of the character and a huge fan of characters like her. Let me speak. Uh, where they're just, they are very, uh, I want to say selfish characters. Right. Their, mo- their motives are like, uh, with somebody like Mystique or Emma Frost, they could just get up today and be like, mm, you know what? Fuck humans, but also fuck mutants. I'm a bad bitch. I'm going to team up with other bad bitches and end all of us. And um, yeah, so this is what we're doing today. Line up, bitches, and I just be there in the back, like, yeah, queen. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, those types of characters where you know that it's all about them in their head, and you're just not sure where it's going to go. It, it just it excites me. It really intrigues me. They definitely add a lot of flavor. I think um, another thing I'm going to uh, throw you away after we chat is that this, this comic called Ruins by, um, fuck, I think Warren Ellis wrote this. Yeah, it was a two-issue um was one of those what if scenarios and in this book pretty much everything that could go wrong in the marvel universe goes wrong but like mystique has like a terrible multiple personality disorder which made sense to me because i was like if you could turn into anybody you'd probably have issues knowing who you are yeah that makes sense fundamentally you'd be like what the fuck am i if i'm just being other people every fucking day which is it? It is interesting, though. It, it leads to some interesting questions. Yeah, for sure. I feel like with Mystique's dynamic, being able to be anybody, like you mentioned, um, I feel like it definitely presents a unique set of uh, what if problems. Um, like identity questions definitely come into play really easily there, and those are always fun questions to ask. Uh, kind of similarly to how ghost in the shell ask questions about identity and you are wondering what defines who i am and how do i know at my core fundamentally if the weather changes if my exterior changes who i am who am i at my core i feel like that definitely is a question that would make sense for her uh in the way she is to struggle with i think that definitely is an interesting thing to explore i always imagined um her if she had a love interest it would be like (laughs) it would be like she's in bed with this person and like you would just be you know you want her to turn into somebody else because you know she could be anybody right but you you want to (laughs) convince i think i have seen that before really like yeah i think she was i I feel like i've seen it in the comic but i do remember distinctly in one of those earlier movies uh, where she was like trying to seduce Wolverine and she was turning into a bunch of different chicks. Like it's a it's a joke that, that has been like kind of played with before. And definitely is interesting. Like it's it's a, it's a fun way to fuck with somebody if you know you're there and you're having a great time with some dude who, you know, is um got seduced by or was initially intrigued by this really sexy hot girl type of image that she was giving them. And then boom yeah. Right in the middle of 69ing, you're <laughs> on top of some <laughs> big hairy dude. It would probably be super traumatic and super funny for him. Or for us, but traumatic for him. She just turns into Xavier. I oh wonder, my goodness. I wonder, if she turns into Xavier, do her legs work? That is truly the final question of this of this chat. D- I feel like can- that's a choice. I feel like that must be a choice for her. She's like, okay, 
I'm you, but then if she can, you know, you know, manipulate her body at will, she must be able to like choose with parts working with parts don't. But then imagine you're with her and you're she gave you the hot girl look, right? Um, to to get you into bed. But then she just turns into you. She just turns into you. Oh no, no, right? no, that's not good. To be that's honest, real. I'm curious. But then again, I'm biased. Again, it's a biased perspective. But I'd be curious, like, you're there, and she just turns into you, you like, just, what You would just do? forgive her. Oh, Mystique, it's, like, it's just you. Like, that's Mystique. fucked up. Oh, silly Mystique, you're so quirky. Um, what but if she starts that, saying like, mean shit about you, about you, as you? Like, that's I, the most I mean, hurtful shit you could, like, like, she's talking shit about But at argument. the same time, you're not wrong. You know what it's like to be me now, so I can't <laughs> say you're like, you know? Like, you have you have inside intel, so, like, I can't say you're lying, you know? It's God, a tough place man. to be in. Uh, oh, my shit, goodness. That's funny. Man, if I, if I see Mystique on the streets, I'm going to avoid her. I'm going to be like, no, it's not happening. Mystique, stay away from me. I, I wish that was and a you best believe I'll be dropping my jacket so that she can cross that puddle. God you best damn. believe she can have my lunch money. All right, everyone, I, I want you to follow Dobby's Dobby's work. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna post some of it as we're chatting so people know like what the fuck we're talking about. But Dobby, mm-hmm. you're you're seriously doing some amazing work. I I want everyone to follow you. Please te- please help people where they can find you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so on Instagram. You can just search Davigo, D-A-V-I space G-O. That should put up my profile. But if you want to give yourself some more work, you can search constant dot risk dot of O-F uh, dot fire. So it's constant risk of fire. Uh, you can, I think you can also search that on Twitter. Yes, you can. But it's a uh, constant risk of fire with spaces in between. And then my handle on Twitter is C Davigo, S-E-E Davigo all together. Um, and then you can just search Daddy going Google and it should pull up everything else that I have, my YouTube, my uh, art station, anything else that you may want to look into. Just search Daddy Go. Boom. Sir, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Take care. See, Davi, fucking awesome. I told you. Make sure to go follow Davi at constant.risk.of.fire. And if you don't want to type all that stuff in, you can just click in the show notes. The show notes will show you. Also, you can hop on his YouTube. I'll leave a little link to that that you can click up there, up on the YouTube if you're watching this. So I, yeah, like I said, I put out that Tyler video and I showed you all how to draw Tyler or how I would. And then um, I just prompted you all to do it. And I got, I think it was seven, seven Tylers came in, some through Gmail ask at domrabron.com if you want to send me anything that's the best place ask at domrabron.com alternatively you can dm me you can post it here whatever you like first one i wanted to talk about that was submitted to me that i enjoyed is from that k fellow on twitter that k fellow this is um you know this is fantastic because of you know, I'm getting that those MS Paint vibes. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what you were using, but like using that 100% opacity, uh, very similar color tones from the lights to the darks. Uh, I really love that drawing. And I don't know why you why you included these two, these two uh, components, but that's cool. I, I like that collage thing you got going on. What you got going on there? I'm going to leave that, leave that up. Second one I got was from Jorge. Jorge who always sends me very nice messages on Twitter. Alberto420-6911. I don't know who this motherfucker is. This dude looks like Patrick Bateman after freshly slaughtering somebody. It's hip to be a square. <laughs> You're your ego. <laughs> dude, I, I love this, Jorge. You got this... Um, you got this this style going on. Like, what, what do you call it? It's like a. It's like that graphic graffiti style that you'll see. It's just, it's very hard on the edges. I'm like I'm like thrusting my fist at the camera. Like I'm gonna beat it up. What else we got? What is this? Mmm. Monochromatic. 
monochromatic from It's Just Fundy. With the, uh, uh, looks like a very Igor, Igor era Tyler. That nice, pretty, uh, modern version of Tyler. Big ounce. Dude, you definitely are the funniest one. Definitely the funniest. Dude, your bees look like, your bees look like goddamn Samoas, like the Girl Scout cookie. Dog. Um... Blue is superior. Always great, great work from work from Blue is superior. I uh, highly recommend that you all follow him. Um, Eyes are green. Eat my vegetables. Now that right here, I think is a. Uh, that was the first thing I thought of. Besides, obviously, I, I like how this looks. The fact that you tied it into the album, I think that's uh, really fucking clever. And I wish I would have thought of that. It's very nice. Tommy Tootsters, of course, with the. Uh, with that that frenetic that frenetic energy that that Basquiat touch, <laughs> touched by Basquiat. That's a movie I, I want to be a part of. All right, last one is from Fetus Twinsies. Fetus Twinsies with the uh, uh, straight up ink, straight up ink. Now I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for submitting. This is, uh, can I count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven of you. Seven souls on earth. Seven of you submitted, and seven of you will get a gift. You're going to get a special gift in the form of a Valley the Summoning card. And that's all I'm going to say. You're going to get further instructions on your gift. If you choo choose, should you choose to go with it, that'll be between me and you individually. The only other people who are going to have access to this information are the concierges on patreon.com slash valet. Okay, now I'm going to be answering podcast questions. Podcast questions that you all had for little old me. Going to be... Uh, answering them from YouTube, questions that I got on YouTube on a little post, and questions that I got on my email. On my email, ask.domrabron.com. Ask ask.domrabron.com and wherever else you guys want to send them to me, but these are my favorite places to get them from. First question, oh man, these are long, god damn. Uh, I'm going to try to get through these. Uh, asks, I was wondering what your stance and or thoughts are on artists like Richard Prince that are challenging the way we see copyright laws, copyright laws in art. Richard Prince famously made art out of fucking Instagram posts and made a pretty penny out of essentially plagiarism. Furthermore, artists like David Bedoni literally just puts a Nike swoosh on old famous paintings and makes a profit. So as artists push these boundaries of what fair use, creative commons, and all that jazz is, do you think the end goal would be a battle royale of appropriation? Should all art be public domain? And how would you think this would affect platforms like YouTube, where cats are... <laughs> where cats are already making AMVs using copyrighted music. I thought she meant cats, like real cats, and that's why I laughed. I was like, cats can make music now? God damn, bro. God damn, this world crazy, bro. Is pitching down a Diana Ross song and calling it Vaporwave really enough to make it transformative? A new fan. Julio Gomez. You're coming with them flames, baby. You're coming with that fucking fire. You got that Contra pistol. That Contra pistol that lets you go... <laughs> I think it's a uh, metal slug I'm thinking of. I don't think it's Contra. I think it's metal slug. Metal slug with the that dumb gun, that that dumb gun. Metal slug was so difficult. The animation the metal slug would fuck you up because it was basically like it, the animation was so cool. You had to go try it, right? You had to play it cuz the frame rate was just insane and everything was just like 
It was plump. I don't know why that's the word, but you know what I'm talking about. Everything seemed to be bulging and breathing. Like even the tanks would kind of, they had this give whenever they would just bounce around somehow in Metal Slug. And of course, you're a kid. Even their facial expressions were like very, it was crazy, right? And you play the game and you can only play it for fucking five minutes. No, actually, oh, geez. Not five minutes. I'm, oof. It was like, you could last in Metal Slug for like a minute 30. That game was too hard. Anyway, Julio Gomez. Appropriating imagery. This is something I feel very strongly about. And I'm just going to tell you the real. I'm going to tell you it as I see it. Um, Because I know there's kind of a more of a PC answer I could give. I don't even know if it's PC. It's more like like making myself seem like I don't. Like like everything is just original, which I don't believe it is at all. Um, it's it's fucking weird. There there's a spectrum. There's a spe- spectrum of copyright infringement and fuckery and hack art, in my opinion. And it there's a range. It's like you, you you're you're falling you're falling on different sides of it, and it's just like I think the the guiding principle should just be. What are your intentions? You know what I mean? Like, what are your intentions with the work? And how, like, how deeply are you manipulating it? And are you, I I don't know whether or not you're you're doing it from a dark place of exploitation. And I think the first thing is, I want all you guys to remember this. I mean, like, if you're going to take something, this is specifically for visual art. This is different for comedy and all that shit. Where people are like, it's if you're gonna take something, you better warp it to the point where it's like people either don't know what it is or like it's clearly yours at that point. Like if he had taken that Nike swoosh and bent it until it was a straight bar, and just in his mind it was still a swoosh, but on the on the thing it's a bar. He still took the swoosh. He all he did was bend it. If I paint a white line. And say this is not a blank symbol. This is and, and, and I in my head I and that bl- that blank is Nike swoosh. I don't know if that makes any fucking sense, but what I'm saying is that if you can, if you can have something that you take only exist in your head, it's still you're st- you can still get the same feeling sometimes. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question properly, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take another bite of it. Uh. Should all art be public domain? I think all art should be after a time. I think I think once an artist is dead, you take their shit. I think they've left it to everybody. Um but again, I'm not saying you just take their shit and reap and just you make it again, but what I'm saying is hmm I'm imagining my words being used against me in some kind of like insane future court where they're like, you used a piece of a Rothko painting. And I'm like, I did not. I am a man. Uh, I think if an artist has been dead for a certain amount of time, come on, take their shit. Come on. And, and furthermore, I mean, come on, you think about hip hop and sampling. It's crazy. Like, Sometimes I'm like truly this copyright infringement shit and like all of these crazy ass laws about who owns a piece of a song. It just feels like the most chaotic Western culture, like capitalism insanity possible because some of it is like legitimate where it's like, okay, clearly you should pay whoever you, you got this from. But other times it's like, listen, man, like this. We're, we're we're doing what artists do and all of a sudden we're in these big intellectual property fights and I don't know. Maybe at some point I will benefit from um copyright law and all that stuff, but for now like, I'm in a position where it's like I'm not I'm not able to pay any sort of restitution on anything. So I think it falls down to artists to I don't know, try to be more conscious about their use, but like I'm gonna fall on the I will usually fall on the side of the artist, even like like douchey ones like Richard Prince or whoever, just doing the Instagram shit. I'm kind of like, a part of me is like, I I understand a core of the intention, but it's tough. Like I'm obviously kind of somewhere in the middle of this. 
Um, I'll answer your last question. Is pitching down a Diana Ross song and calling it Vaporwave really enough to make it transformative? Uh, there are two answers to that. It's like, is it transformative? Is it transformative according to the law? Can a my thing is is usually like, oh, can can it fool Google? Can it can it fool a computer searching for like the similarities? Because at some point, like a Bach a Bach song is, you could transform it to make it sound like Billy Jean, right? But then you could transform it back to make it not. I don't know. That's my answer to that last question. I I really don't know, but that's a that's a tough question. If you all want to weigh in, I would love to see your ideas on this in the comments below because I mean it's that's a big one. I don't know the copyright infringement shit. Thank you for your question, Julio Gomez. I got two big ones. Two big ones from uh Dan James. Dan James, fantastic uh old school DSC watcher. Um I want to welcome Dan's messenger. Dan sent a messenger and you all can send a messenger by the way. You can send a messenger with your with your question and I will address them directly, okay? I'll treat them nicely. I have a lot of uh, cool stuff here in the realm of creation in the Cerberus house. You know, they have a nice couch they, they can sit on. I don't have an image of it yet, but I'm actually working on it. Uh, we're creating a waiting room for these messengers to come and just send me your little message. I usually give them a little gift to go home with as well, so yeah. Uh, Dan James's messenger says, Dom, you've been given the opportunity to create the half-hour TV show of your own design. What is it called, and what's the premise? Thank you, uh, spray paint, uh, uh, sentient spray paint man. <laughs> um, the opportunity to create the half-hour TV show of my own design. God, this is like a dream. You realize this is like all I fucking want. All right, it's not all I want. But, it, but this is like, there are two versions of what I want. There's the, there's the thing that I want that doesn't involve anyone telling me what to do. And is like purely funded by you watching this so that I mean, I like so that I can do what I want creatively. And I don't have a, an executive saying to me, uh, you know, the, 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 the black character. Um, yeah, it's a little it's a little weird. Like, I don't ever want to have that conversation. It was like the sexuality is a little strange. And nope. So the half hour TV show of my design and of my dreams would probably be on something like FX or Adult Swim, HBO. That would be cool as well. Um, it's called How to Date a Necromancer. And I've been thinking about this idea for a while. I, could, I think I could knock it out in probably four 30-minute episodes where I have – I'd want to have like really cool shit like um, Daniel Kaluuya playing the main character – uh, vocally, it would be some kind of a, it would be like a weird rotoscoped Basquiat painting uh, thing where it's like the characters go from being like kind of animated the way you think they would to going to this other dimension. And I've been writing a script about this, what what it would be like first to be a, a necromancer, second to be a black necromancer. It's like, is it weirder? Because I, I imagine it's definitely weird <laughs> being a black necromancer, and then it's like for this black necromancer who's trying to fit in with the the, the this this new like w the way you usually uh, imagine necromancers, right? It's like a old white dude. He's like, well, man, and now I will raise the dead. And th this new guy is like, yeah, actually, I don't deal with sm smelly bodies. I don't deal with corpses that way. Blah blah. blah. So that person who's trying to date. And he's he's getting with someone like uh, I don't know uh, Zendaya. <laughs> you see how quickly I pulled that one up? Yeah, that's the premise. All right, next question we got is from the messenger from Tommy Tootsters. Tommy Tootsters messenger has uh, always has some big funny socks on. He he has uh, he has shorts on that are always too big for him as well. He's kind of weird. Um, all right, and he's he's saying some things to me, and I don't really uh, I don't really understand what he says. But anyway. Tommy Tootsters says, hey there, Dom, I've made a grave mistake. In your last sketch cast, you wanted a question from the point of view of a tree. So I used my level five magic to give a tree consciousness so I could interview it. All it does, though, is ask why I gave him sentience. <laughs> it wants death upon itself now, and it's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> Should I kill it or do something else? I'm very conflicted right now. 
Well, uh, you also sent me this this image of this tree who does look like it's in a lot of distress. This is tough. You know, I really enjoy the kill me trope. Uh, the, the kill me trope, you know, of like, I have no mouth and I'm a scream. Come on. Beautiful, delicious. But actually experiencing that in real life seems kind of stressful. Um, first off, this is your fault using level five magic. I don't even know if you're level five yet. But I don't think you should have been using that magic. Uh, now you got a sentient tree that wants to be, uh, so it wants to be dead and it's asking why I think to kill this tree is probably inhumane, but what you have to do is you're going to have to do something kind of dark. You will have to get a, you're going to. It isn't humane and it sucks, but I think you're going to have to put this tree down. Also, before you do that, if you get a piece of its bark, you could probably turn that into a wand, a new magic wand. So that's probably what I would do. And it's going to it's probably going to scream in pain, but you'll at least have a, a mystical item to work with. Thank you, Tommy Tuesters, for that question. God damn. I really have more questions than I expected. Uh, so we're going to grab another one of these from YouTube. Another one of these questions from YouTube, and then we're going to skedaddle. All right, so we got a uh, question from Masochistic Meese. Masochistic Meese is always posted on a YouTube. Cool person. They, ha- they also have a, a kind of funny avatar that I like. Masochistic Meese says, I've been interested in going to school for music for a while, but the more I study on my own in preparation, coupled with all the people I know who are relatively successful musicians and people I'm seeing online that say it's definitely not worth the money, the more I feel like it's not for me. Wow, that was a big sentence. I don't even know if I said that right. Ooh, I, I think people get the gist. However... The main benefit of those places, like those art, those music schools, is always the community you're surrounded by, teachers, students, and faculty. How do I go about getting into a community with no job and a f- and few friends? Oh man. Um. I mean, I don't know much about the music industry. I know, I know, you don't need it to make good music. You do need it. I mean, like you might need it to connect with certain people, but like there are obviously other ways to connect with people who that don't doesn't have to do with the music school. I mean, so many people on like that are coming up right now are not like Justin Wobbs, who I know well. I mean, he he never went to that. There's so many people who are great, um, who are having on the mu- music school, and it seems like you're, you're talking about the networking. If networking is what you want, you don't need school for that. You can be diligent online and posting on everywhere. I mean, you're going to have to work for it. I think you're going to have to be super social. And um, I know musicians aren't aren't the most social people. Like, they're probably weirder than visual artists even um, in terms of being social. But, you know, you got to use the Internet. If you're not going to go to school, um, even if you go to school, you should be using the Internet for that. Mm -mm -mm. Last question. From BagelNet, who has a really weird YouTube channel. Uh, I, it's it's weird. I love it. Uh, BagelNet asks, what do you put on your bagels? I like a, I like a good like herb and chive cheese, like a, ve- a veggie, veggie and chive cream cheese. Yes, I like that. On a toasted everything bagel. I don't see a lot of everything bagels on your, on your, um, on your, damn channel dude that's fucking racist dude you gotta put them (laughs) you gotta put them poppy seed bagels on there you need some everything you need some asiago bagels which are never that good i don't really fuck with asiago bagels like that but i fuck with you for watching this and listening to this thank you for showing up let me know what you think of this new thing i changed the format a little bit this time let me know what you think of it i can only know what's happening if you all tell me how how it's going with you so yeah shout out to davigo once again 
Be sure to follow him. Shout out to you. I will see you all next week. Don't forget, there's some other cool shit on my uh, channel right now. It's going on. A couple Tyler videos, a couple new prints on my shop. All that stuff. Links to uh, are in the show notes if you want to help me out with that sort of thing. And um, really, thank you for listening and contributing to this. All of you who drew, um, who are making this larger into this bigger thing. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. See you next time. Goodbye.